All right, hello, friends. My name is Weston Nakamura from Blockworks Macro in Tokyo. It is Monday, April 24th, 2023 at Asia Markets Close. Welcome to the Market Depth Podcast, bringing you global market commentary and analysis from the Asia-Pacific trading session so that you know what happened overnight. We are at the start of what may be a very historic and consequential week in global macro markets with eyes focused on the Bank of Japan April meeting this Friday, in which a brand new and unknown Bank of Japan Governor Ueda will hold his first Bank of Japan policy meeting and press conference. And again, this is all happening this Friday. And with the Fed in its quiet period ahead of March FOMC next week to follow, uh, to follow this Friday's BOJ, all eyes will indeed be on the Bank of Japan. So for this week, as we lead up to this potentially monumental macro catalyst, I'm going to cover the Bank of Japan day by day from just various angles and kind of ask the, the big questions, right? Things like how the Bank of Japan got itself into this current situation of being the lone major central bank left who's still easing um, and easing so much for so long that they've potentially reached a point of no return. Um, where do markets stand currently in terms of expectation and positioning ahead of April BOJ? Um, what are my views um, for what will come of the Bank of Japan on Friday, um, as well as potentially the next Bank of Japan meeting thereafter? Um, and then, of course, on Friday uh, itself will be the post-Bank of Japan decision and press conference coverage, fresh off the heels of Governor Ueda potentially, um, <laughs> I, I don't know, potentially doing a good job, potentially not. Who, who the hell knows? We'll see. But for today, just to kick the week off, let's talk about how could the Bank of Japan potentially blow up global markets um, as well as potentially alter the path of other major central banks and their um, policy decisions? Um, what's the, you know, what's the Bank of Japan risk that's overhanging, right? Um, and what market response may come in the immediate as well as in the long term should there be a policy shift? In other words, why should you care about this, okay? Uh, we'll get into that, but First, let me just address some of the headlines overnight. So we have another Bank of Japan press test from Japanese media Sankei News. Okay, so the Sankei newspaper reported on Sunday that the Bank of Japan is planning to review um, its its policies taken over the past decades, doing a, you know essentially do a policy review. Uh, by the way, for those wondering what I mean by the term press test, this is something that I've coined years ago. It's basically referring to when the Bank of Japan or Japanese officials uh, leak their own policy agenda through targeted media outlets in order to get um, a test read on market reactions. And if the market reaction is volatile or adverse to their desires, then they can always come out and talk markets back and you know to where they were by saying like, oh, that's just nonsense, you know, press speculation, fake news, whatever, citing anonymous sources and, and all that. And th thereby it reinforces exactly why they need to do such press tests, right? Because if it were released as official policy, or even uttered by like a BOJ official on public record, then any fa unfavorable market move wouldn't be able to be undone like that, right? There's no like, never mind, never mind, we didn't mean it, right? Or th there's no um, like, what, what, that? That was just the Bank of Japan governor's speech. Complete nonsense. Markets, reset, please, right? There's, there's obviously, there's no doing of that, okay? That's why press test, okay? So today's press test comes to you thanks to Sankei News um, that came out on Sunday. Meaning this was a process that was targeted at the Japan domestic investor base into Monday Asia Open. Um, and as I mentioned, this press test is saying that um, it, it was learned that the Bank of Japan has begun to make preparations to conduct a review of its monetary easing measures from a long-term perspective spanning a quarter of a century. Okay, now let's put the validity of this like reporting aside for now okay let's just like for argument's sake let's just take this as what boj is actually doing and saying as if they themselves announced it okay so what would this mean for boj to conduct a policy review well there's basically two general ways to to read this number one it means nothing of substance Right for the BOJ to conduct a review of its policy after a decade of experimental coronomics, regardless of external inflation or market environment or anything like that, that sounds like a very normal, necessary thing to do, especially with leadership change. Um, you know, and then, you know, Bank of Japan Governor, then nominee Ueda, during his parliamentary confirmation hearings, has stated that such a policy review would be necessary. So you know, kind of in line, right, with with what was already said. Um, in fact. 
former Bank of Japan gov Deputy Governor Amamiya, okay, he was the guy who was supposed to be the current Bank of Japan Governor until he bailed last minute and then th thus sent uh, Prime Minister Kishida and his administration scrambling for someone, for anyone, to take this very unwanted role of Bank of Japan governor until they landed on Ueda, right? Amamiya's, like, BS nonsense reason for his not taking the Bank of Japan governor role after four decades of service at the Bank of Japan crafting monetary policy, his, his stated reason for not taking the BOJ governor role was that th there's going to be a policy review. And then given his own personal involvement in, you know, being the, the policy architect of the BOJ for the last, you know, several years, he therefore needs to, like, recuse himself from this sort of policy review process um, and thereby decline the entire role as the BOJ governor altogether. Uh, clearly nonsense. And as I've been saying ever since the world started asking uh, and, and analyzing, who is this Ueda guy, right? During that time, I've actually been saying, forget that. Uh, what I want to know is why did Amamiya turn the job down and like so last minute? Like, what does he see from the inside that we don't see that that's coming and that's so horrific that it warrants him stepping down after 40 years of not stepping down throughout all these challenges that the BOJ had had to you know endure? Um, and ultimately, what I've been saying was that basically anyone who is in the know and qualified enough to take the Bank of Japan governor position anyone who is qualified enough to take that doesn't want it and the only people who would take that job as the boj governor to succeed kuroda are those who have no idea what they're walking into and they have no idea that they have no idea what they're inheriting okay but anyway sorry to digress but that's one way to read this press test of this policy review coming it's no surprise whatsoever it's like long discussed and is expected as sort of you know just part of part of the the, the process the other way to read it is that this particular press test from Sankei calls for a review of not just of the Kuroda decade, but as I said, a quarter century of BOJ policy, maybe even 30 years, they say, right? So that basically would span the entire BOJ easing experiment from like inception, modern you know easing experiment from inception. And by BOJ easing experiment, I mean the global easing experiment because the BOJ is the world's leader in policy experimentation cutting race to the zero bound, inventing QE, and so on, right? Um, these are things that occurred well before Kuroda. So Sanke News goes on to say that uh, the review is meant to be a record of changes in the Japanese economy and monetary policy and is unlikely to involve a change in policy. However, if the committee decides to examine the impact of eliminating the 0% or so guidance target for long-term interest rates, which would be the first step towards normalizing monetary policy, it could lead to future policy changes. Okay, so that's the other way it could be read. In other words, more or less in line with what the BOJ has been trying to craft um, as its image in this leadership transition period, right? The BOJ will be unchanged, but maybe not. But if not, then not now. But maybe at least start the discussion now. Purposely and overly vague um, and keeping things stable and unchanged while while ruling nothing out and providing no timeline, right? Trying to buy as much option optionality as possible. Um, okay, so following the press test, we also have Ueda in parliament today. And once again, he is parroting Kuroda, right? He's saying BOJ must maintain easing um, because trend inflation is below 2%. Basically, it would be the same thing as if it was still Kuroda, right? That's what he's been doing since becoming governor, since before he even became governor, while he, while he was still a uh, nominee, okay? We are not in the stage of discussing normalizing of yield curve control. Okay, so that's the kind of headlines of the day, and really, there's nothing to read into from, from those alone, um, personally. I don't think that there's anything particularly significant uh, of those two particular headlines alone. Now, on to the matter of... How might the Bank of Japan destroy markets, potentially, starting this Friday? Well, I mean, I guess there's an infinite number of ways, really. Um, but, you know, like, uh, with regarding the April BOJ um, or any BOJ meeting or policy change or policy action, right, and how it can royal markets, generally speaking, there's two general sort of ways that, that this could happen. Number one, the first way is what I've been flagging since over a year ago in early 2022, 
which a year later now, looking back, has by and large taken place already, which is that Japanese investors in Japan's private sector capital not only becomes absent from buying foreign assets as, as it's usually as it usually does, namely foreign sovereign bonds like U.S. Treasuries, but becomes net sellers of such assets, resulting in an explosion of yields higher and borrowing costs for governments worldwide that have been knowingly or otherwise dependent on this flood of Japanese capital demand to cap yields in their respective um, sovereign bond markets for the past several years, especially since yield curve control came around. This is what this concept of Japan and JGBs being the world's duration anchor is all about, right? And so if that anchor is lifted, then bond yields around the world would explode higher, as in their prices would implode and their yields would explode higher. And that in turn hits risk assets. So that's the Japan matchstick blow-up scenario number one. And again, this is not really a scenario anymore that because that was the reality in 2022, hence the largest selling of foreign bonds and U.S. treasuries on record by the Japanese, who are the largest foreign holders of these treasuries. And when the largest foreign holder of treasuries sells the most treasuries it holds on record, fair to assume that might have contributed to what was the worst year for bond market total return performance. Maybe. And then number two, okay, the the other risk, this is the real one, and this is the more immediate BOJ risk, would be a sudden change to yield curve control can potentially ignite a massive volatility explosion in an already illiquid and highly volatile global rate market. Okay, so just to cover the first one first. As I mentioned, Japan is the world's largest foreign asset owner on the planet, been shoved out of the domestic bond market in search of yield, for its massive piles of cash you know overseas namely into government bonds such as u.s treasuries for which you know this very capital makes japan the largest foreign creditor to the united states government okay and the risk is that if the bank of japan widens the trading bands on yield curve control and allows for jgb yields to move higher that will entice japanese asset allocators to liquidate and repatriate trillions in overseas asset holdings uh, now that domestic JGB yields offer some nominal yield at home. Now, I've discussed this at length before, um, and although it remains a legitimate risk, here's why it's sort of nonsense, as it, um, at least as, as it's currently being presented, okay? First of all, as I said, it's already taken place, right? Like, it could certainly continue, but it's already taken place, by and large. So, um, when you see articles that are dated March and April 2023 of this, like, looming risk... Again, it's already been underway for a year now, um, and it's not US, just U.S. Treasuries, right? So if you consider the NIIP, Net International Investment Position, okay, that's basically how much overseas investment net of investment from overseas, for which Japan has the highest positive net NIIP in the world and the U.S. has the lowest in the world, meaning on a net-net basis, Japan deploys the most capital overseas and the U.S. has the most uh, invested into the U.S. net of outbound U.S. capital investment, okay? So if you take a look at this chart for, of Japan and IAP for, for data that goes back uh, to only you know October of 2022, from October 2020 to the July 2022 peak, Japan and IAP rose from 300 trillion yen to 460 trillion yen, or about a 50% increase in that time frame alone. Um, but then in mid last year, 2022, it sharply reverses by about 40 trillion yen, or about $300 billion from July 2022 to October 2022. And that's the last sort of data that we have. That is what Japan divesting overseas holdings looks like, um, of which half of that amount, or about 20 trillion yen, was in foreign bonds, um, the most on record. Um, and according to figures from the Nikkei, Basically, they were saying that the last time that Japan was net sellers of foreign bonds was in 2013. And in 2022, 2022 was eight times the amount of 2013. So it's not only the most, but it's the most, like, it's a fast on, pace on record as well, okay? Um, also note that the amount of foreign bonds bought by Japanese investors from 2013, chrononomic start until 2022, uh, was about 80 trillion yen. And that happens to be the amount at which the Bank of Japan was targeting their yearly QQE amount, right, of 80 trillion yen. Um, and that was before instituting yield curve control, when, which they shifted away from QE, quantitative easing, which is quantity targeting, to yield curve control, which is now price level targeting. Okay, 
So Japan investors turn from being the largest net buyers of foreign bonds to massive, massive net sellers in mid-2022, or even earlier in 2022. But JGB yields didn't move during that time, at least the 10-year yield, which was pinned at 25 basis points cap. Yeah, the longer end of the JGB yield curve, like 20-year, 30-year, and 40-year yields skyrocketed. Uh, alongside global yields and offered higher domestic nominal yields, but JGB yield, 10 year ten year yields didn't change, right? So why the selling, right? It's what the, the the whole kind of repatriation back home thing that wouldn't make sense in in that in that environment because JGB yields didn't change, yield curve control didn't change during that time. So why why were they selling? It was FX hedging costs that got insanely and prohibitively prohibitively expensive for Japanese investors okay so basically on a net basis for something like three month rolling forwards right the cost of foreign exchange hedging completely wiped out the nominal yield spread premium between 10-year US Treasury yields and 10-year JGB yield differentials right there's like a variety of ways that hedging is done and so there's a variety of ways this is kind of calculated but Largely, it's due to front-end yield curves, respectively, in which you have a negative policy rate in Japan and you're skyrocketing Fed funds or front-end rate in the United States. Um, here's a chart of what the net yield is for a Japanese investor of 10-year U.S. Treasuries um, on a currency-hedged basis. And you can see that not only does the nominal yield spread differential, that premium, get wiped away, but it starts going negative and thereby makes investing in U.S. Treasuries not only pointless, but expensive. So, in 2022, foreign bond selling wasn't exactly a function of higher nominal yields in JGB land to repatriate to, but rather due to hedging costs. Furthermore, ever since the December 22 um, shock yield curve control change, when BOJ did lift the yield curve control cap on 10-year JGBs from 25 basis points to 50 basis points, it's not like we saw a mass repatriation take place from that point either. So, if anything, we've been seeing the return of net buying of foreign bonds again. Okay, and that's largely in part to, to being very underweight. Japan is very underweight for portfolios of these uh, of, of foreign bonds and foreign assets. Um, so there's also that. Okay. Also, as I've stated repeatedly, two more points. If the Bank of Japan starts to embark on yield curve control hiking cycle, okay, then the Japanese investors aren't just going to sell everything and rush back into the JGB market that they know is on a cycle that just began, where yields will get incrementally lifted with each meeting or whatever it is. Um, and so while you might get some nibbling back into JGBs back in, from you know domestic investors, likely they'll wait for what feels as like an adequate level to start rebuilding their long JGB portfolios, um, which isn't something that happens all at once at first move um, and, and with more hikes coming from the BOJ, right? So this like divestment and repatriation, that would happen over the course of, of time um, and over that time in which hedging cost dynamics and attractiveness of foreign yields may very well also change and come back into and out of favor, right? It's not black and white, okay? So that's the first thing. Second thing is, just put very simply, just because Japan has the most foreign asset holdings, it does not mean that every last one of these are at risk of full liquidation for repatriation to plow back into JGBs or otherwise, okay? Um, so... Can the Bank of Japan lifting yield curve control cap and allowing for higher nominal yields at home be a risk to foreign bonds? Yes, I'm not disputing that. Uh, what I have an issue with, however, is how it's being presented as this like potential looming risk that may come. Dude, it's already happened, okay? Can it happen more? Yes. Is it something to now start watching out for? No, you're a year too late. So that's the first way the BOJ can cause market turmoil. Just simply not a good read on the situation as it currently stands. But the second risk is the real one. Okay, and the more immediate BOJ risk, which is a sudden change to yield curve control can potentially ignite a massive volatility explosion in an already illiquid and highly volatile global rate market and environment. Okay, now if you see any of my recent rep uh, recent episodes of Market Depth in which I discuss the insane rate volatility that took place in the month of March and how the utter collapse of yields was initiated by the March Bank of Japan 
meeting and not Silicon Valley Bank or Credit Suisse or anything like that, right? If you see those, if you've been watching that, you already know probably what I'm going to say, right? But there are serious structural problems with trading and market liquidity and market mechanics in the sovereign bond markets currently. I've been warning of this for some time now, and March of this year put that on full display when we saw absolutely insane and historic movements in treasuries, in U.S. treasuries, in German boons, and yes, in JGBs. And net-net, March saw a directional collapse in yields, particularly at the front end of these curves, where you know two-year yields would plummet by like a full percent in a few trading days, right? So first of all, as I said, that was triggered by March BOJ in a scramble for cheapest to deliver JGBs upon March JGB futures expiry following the March BOJ. Um, that's what triggered and snowballed this global yield insanity and yield com collapse. And I urge you once again to see my previous episodes that walks through the timeline of events to show you exactly what took place that week in mid-March, which saw the largest foreign buying of JGBs on record and second largest buying of foreign bonds by Japanese on record. And I've also discussed how hedge funds blowing up as a result of this volatility, volatility in rates. And then like the, the Goldman um, fixed income desk losses that resulted in Goldman's bad earnings relative to, to its peers and how all that ties into this, right? Well, those extreme moves occurred because the BOJ caused a massive short squeeze and a directional bid, a buying for bonds, a, a collapse in yields. In other words, yields cliff diving at an incredibly violent pace. Well, the bond markets are no more liquid and no less volatile today than they were last month. And so what happens if the extreme yield move went the other way, in which the BOJ lifts yield curve control, triggers volatility and illiquidity, but from a global bond market sell-off and sends yields surging the other way instead of plummeting, right? If U.S. Treasury yields spiked by 1%, 100 basis points in like three days, what the hell would markets look like then? You're talking about NASDAQ and correction within a week, a VIX that's far from the teens as it currently is. Um, and then if it exacerbates like it did in the UK gilt market in September of October, uh, September and October of 2022, you're going to find a situation in which the Fed will be doing emergency yield curve control, directly bidding for unlimited 30-year U.S. treasuries while simultaneously trying to get their last rate hike in and trying to get this impossible messaging task of saying that this is for market stabilization purposes and this is not a pivot for stimulus. Okay, and good luck with that, Fed, if, that, if you ever find yourself in that scenario. So that's the risk, okay, or that's a risk. Um, and it's not just for this BOJ meeting, uh, but this is for any one of them going forward for which BOJ under new leadership tries to do any sort of yield curve control change. That process will never, ever go smoothly. Bank Japan is too far in the hole to have that option of an orderly exit like at their disposal. They threw that away long, long ago. So that's why this matters. It matters to your long US stock portfolio or your crypto portfolio or your whatever portfolio because we're talking about direct impact on the US risk-free rate, okay? So keep an eye on market depth this week as this week progresses as I go over more topics leading into the Bank of Japan itself. Uh, make sure you have your notifications turned on. Make sure that you are subscribed to Market Depth on Blockworks Macro. Make sure you're following me on Twitter at Across the Spread. Strap in and get ready for a potentially wild week as we head into a very consequential April Bank of Japan under new leadership. On behalf of Blockworks Macro, my name is Weston Nakamura. We will see you again. Thank you.